Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me let me thank all of you for coming out. Let me thank all of you for your determination to revitalize American democracy. Let me thank all of you for your efforts to create a government in America and state by state which represents all of the people and not just the one percent. Now I would, I would thank Pudi for that very generous introduction, but he gave away my whole speech. Thanks a lot, Pudi. <laughs> but I'll try. And let me also take this opportunity uh, to thank the people of Iowa. Uh, for over a year, I spent a lot of time in this beautiful state. And I did the kind of politics that I love to do. And that is we did well over 100 town meetings. And we met with tens of thousands of Iowans in your largest cities and in your smallest towns. And I just want to thank all of you for your hospitality and your kindness, and many of you for the support that you gave me. Thank you very much. You know, during the campaign, I talked a whole lot about what I believe is absolutely essential for us to bring about in this country, and that is a political revolution. And that is exactly what CCI has been doing in this state for many decades. What you have been doing is bringing people from different walks of life together, urban, rural, black and white and Latino, and bringing folks together to address and solve the major problems facing this beautiful state. When low-income people in Waterloo and Clarksville have access to decent quality primary health care, CCI fought to establish the People's Community Health Clinic to provide affordable care to everyone who walks through the door. And at a time when primary health care is in disastrous shape throughout this country, that is a major achievement. When family farmers were struggling with a severe financial crisis in the 1980s, CCI helped over 1,200 small and mid-sized farms obtain the credit they desperately needed to stay in business. Our job is to fight for family farmers and take on corporate agriculture. Thank you for what you're doing. When predatory mortgage lenders were ripping off homeowners, in Iowa, CCI changed the way they did business and helped recover over $5 million in assets for Iowa's families. Thank you, CCI. And maybe most importantly, when people in this room, in this state, in Vermont and all over this country understand that we cannot continue a political system in which billionaires buy elections, CCI has led the effort in this state to get big money out of politics by moving to public financing of elections. So what you are doing here in Iowa is in many states a model for what we have got to do in terms of grassroots politics all over this country. I don't have to tell anybody here that we are in a pivotal 
moment in American history. And to be honest with you, nobody is quite sure the direction in which this country will go in the future. On one hand, if we do not get our act together, if people all over this country do not stand up and fight back the way you are, there is a real likelihood that the trend toward oligarchy will only intensify. The trend toward having a handful of billionaire families with unlimited resources controlling our political process will only get worse. The trend toward a handful of conglomerates owning and controlling our economy will only get worse. And what our job is, and I know you are working on that, is to create a vibrant democracy where one person, one vote is what dominates the political system, not billionaires buying elections. All of you are aware that one of the worst Supreme Court decisions in the history of our country, the five to four decision on Citizens United, has laid the, founding, found, laid the foundation for the undermining of American democracy by saying to the Koch brothers and Sheldon Adelson and other billionaires, you can spend as much money as you want in order to buy candidates who will represent the wealthy and the powerful. And what we are saying together is that is not what brave men and women fought and died for in the fight to maintain American democracy. American democracy is not the Koch brothers buying elections. It is ordinary Americans determining the future of this country. But the struggle that we are facing in order to create a vibrant democracy is not only this disastrous Supreme Court decision on Citizens United. It's not just billionaires buying elections. It is governors all over this country, Republican governors, cowardly governors, who don't have the guts to run for office based on their ideas, but who are attempting to suppress the vote to keep low-income people or people of color or working people or older people from participating in the political process. You know, in a democracy, in a democracy, people have differences of opinion, and that's a good thing, and we should respect that. And if some Republican wants to run for office talking about giving tax breaks to billionaires and cutting Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and education, that is his or her prerogative. Run for office on those ideas. See how many votes you get. But don't, don't run for office by helping to suppress the vote and make it harder for people who will vote against you to participate in the political process. If you can't run for office based on your ideas, then get out of politics and get another job. Right now, in state after state, and in Washington, we're hearing that we need massive types of restrictions, voter IDs of all kinds, to keep people from voting. We hear a president of the United States saying something that is absolutely untrue. No Democratic election official, no Republican election official agrees with him when he says three to five million people in the last election voted illegally. That is an absolute lie. 
And all of that stuff, all of that is about nothing more than encouraging state officials all over this country to suppress the vote. We will not accept that. We believe in democracy. Our job together, our job together is to bring more people into the political process, not fewer. We recognize that in the United States today, we have one of the lowest voter turnouts, turnout rates of any major country on earth. In the midterm elections in 2014, all of 37% of the American people voted. Young people did not vote in any kind of numbers. Poor people did not vote. We are going to fight for a vibrant American democracy where the doors of that democracy are wide open. We want more and more people into that process, not fewer. And instead of figuring out ways to make it harder for people to vote, we need to have automatic automatic voter registration when you're 18. We must also restore voting rights to people who have lost those rights. Many states take away the right to vote from convicted felons and do not restore that right even after those people have paid their debt to society. And in my view, that's wrong. After you pay your debt, you cannot lose your democratic rights as an American. Let's restore those rights. is not just billionaires not being able to buy elections, is that we cannot have super PACs and other type of PACs where people can put unlimited sums of money into the political process without even revealing who they are. And I want to congratulate you here in Iowa because we have got to do it nationally. We need public funding of elections. No more superpacks. You know, the truth is that democracy is a very radical idea, and it's rather new to human history. 100 years ago, 150 years ago, the belief was that we have kings and czars and very powerful people to head countries who had the divine right to rule, to determine whether people went to war, what taxes people paid. But all over the world, and in our country, people said, no, we're going to end the rule of the few and replace it with the rule of the many. And I don't have to tell anybody here that the fight for democracy in this country has been a very difficult one from day one. We have had many, many ups and downs in that struggle. When this country was first founded, needless to say, African Americans were not voting. They were held in chains. Women were not voting. They were second-class citizens. Poor whites who weren't landowners, were not voting. But over the years, the essential struggle in this country was to create a democracy in which all people had the right to participate. Not so many years ago, during the war in Vietnam, people said, we're sending young people over to a war to fight and get killed but they didn't even have the right to vote 
on whether that war was a good idea or not. And the voting age was lowered from 21 to 18. So throughout our history, what the struggle has been about is to create a true democracy where all of our people, regardless of their income, regardless of their gender, regardless of the color of their skin, all people could help determine the future of our nation. But right now, I have to tell you that in many respects, our democracy is facing enormous challenges. Not only as a result of Citizens United, not only as a result of gerrymandering, not only as a result of voter suppression, but all over this country, people are giving up on the political process. Just 37% of American people today can name their own member of Congress. Most people don't know the name, the political party of their member of Congress. Only 25% of Americans can name all three branches of government, and nearly a third of Americans cannot name any of the three branches. In 2014, over one-third of voters did not know which party controlled the U.S. House or the U.S. Senate. On average, the American people believe that we spend 31% of our federal budget on foreign aid. We spend 1% of our budget on foreign aid. In other words, what we need to do, and this is no small undertaking, is to revitalize American democracy, get people involved in the political process, have an agenda which speaks to the issues that impact them, and then work together to resolve those problems. Now, this is easier said, this is easier said than done. Easier said than done. Because you're a lot of people, you go knocking on somebody's door and say, don't bother me. I don't want to get involved in politics. They're all crooks. Doesn't matter what I feel. Nobody pays attention to my needs. I'm working two or three jobs. Kid can't afford to go to college. I'm worried about my mother, who's in a nursing home. Who cares? Who's worried about me? And what the political revolution is about is, in fact, creating a nation in which we are worried and fighting for the needs of working families, not just billionaires who want more tax breaks. Now, this is hard stuff. This is admittedly very, very hard to make people believe that their needs can be addressed, that if they become involved in the political process and elect people at the local, state, national level, that in fact we can address the concerns that they have. Because the whole world, the entire establishment, the media, everybody else, is basically telling people, don't get involved, don't be ridiculous, you are powerless, big money controls what's going on, why are you wasting your time, why are you coming to a meeting? today on a Saturday afternoon. You can't do anything. The system is rigged. Give it up. But we are saying that we love this country, and we are going to fight for an American democracy that will make future generations proud. And this is tough. This is tough stuff. This is not easy stuff, and it's not going to be resolved in a day. But I know that all of you here in CCI are committed to making that happen. Now, I want to say a word to the people here in Iowa who voted for Donald Trump. When Donald Trump ran for president, he told the people of Iowa, he told the people of Vermont, told the people of this country that he was going to stand up for the working class of this country. 
that he was going to take on the establishment, that he was going to take on Wall Street, he was going to take on the pharmaceutical industry, he was going to provide health care for everybody. And I'm sorry to have to tell you this. I'm sorry to have to tell you what I know an increasing number of Americans understand. And that is Donald Trump lied. He said he was going to take on the establishment, but he has brought more billionaires into his administration than any president in the history of this country. He said that he was very concerned about what Wall Street was doing to America. And yet he has brought in the president of Goldman Sachs to be his chief economic advisor. And I want to tell you something that I am working on night and day, right now, and I'm very, very worried about. Trump told the people of Iowa that he was going to stand with the working class of this state and the working class of America, but he is currently supporting the most anti-working class legislation ever presented in the modern history of this country a disastrous health care bill which will come before the Senate, I believe, on Tuesday or Wednesday. Now, President Trump, don't tell the people of this country that you support the working class when you are defending legislation which will throw 22 million Americans off of the health care they currently have. That is not defending the working class. That is a major attack on middle class and working class families all across this country. Don't tell working families that you are concerned about their needs when you want to cut Medicaid by $800 billion over a 10-year period. And I want you all, and I want the President to understand what the consequences of that action are. Medicaid is the major source of funding for those families who have disabled kids. And we got a lot of disabled kids in Vermont, you got them here in Iowa, all over this country. You have people right now in America who have cancer, who have heart disease, who have diabetes, who have life-threatening illnesses, and who today are scared to death as to what might happen if they lose their health insurance. And you think about it, and I want the President to think about it, I want Iowa Senators to think about it. What happens? What happens if today you are dealing with cancer, you're dealing with heart disease, and Medicaid is your source of insurance, and that insurance is taken away from you? And I will tell you what will happen. This is not Bernie Sanders speaking. This is study after study after study which tells us what all of us instinctually know, that if you are struggling for your life with a life-threatening disease and they take away your health insurance, thousands of Americans will die every single year. In America, we should not be giving tax breaks to billionaires and insurance companies and drug companies and taking away health insurance from people who have cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. That is not what this country is supposed to be about. And to all of those people in Iowa and Vermont, 
throughout this country who have pre-existing conditions, and there are millions of them, they are staying up nights and worrying, what happens if this Republican bill gets passed? How are they going to be able to get insurance that they can afford? And if the Republican bill is passed, they will not be able to get the insurance that they can need, that they need and can afford. And let me tell you the politics of what's going on right now. There are 52 Republicans, 48 of us in the Democratic caucus. The Republicans will need 50 votes in order to pass this horrific legislation because the vice president will then cast the tie-breaking vote. Right now, two Republicans have said for different reasons that they will oppose what we call the motion to proceed. Two Republicans. <laughs> Senator Collins of Maine for the right reasons, Senator Paul of Kentucky, because he thinks this bill did not go far enough, but will take his no vote nonetheless. <laughs> which means, which means that right now we need one more Republican vote. And I say to Senator Grassley and Senator Ernst, please, please take a hard look at what this disastrous legislation will do to the people of Iowa and the people of America. And I say to them, I beg of them, please vote no on this legislation. It is not widely known, you know, it is not widely known. You know, people think, well, Medicaid is just a health insurance program for lower income people. Please understand that Medicaid pays about two thirds of the funding for those people who are in nursing homes. All right. So I say to the people of Iowa and I've said to the people of my own state, if you've got a mom, a dad dealing with Alzheimer's or some other problem and is in a nursing home. What happens when Medicaid is severely cut and those people are forced out of the nursing homes? Who's going to take care of them? What happens to their lives? I say to Senator Grassley and Senator Ernst, please understand that if this legislation goes through, a 60-year-old worker here in Des Moines who makes $40,000 a year could see their health insurance increase from some $4,000 a year today to $8,000, an almost doubling of premiums for older workers. Now, the truth is that all over this country, about half of older workers have almost nothing in the bank as they prepare for retirement. That is a major crisis. And yet this legislation would almost double premiums for older workers here in Iowa. My Republican colleagues talk a whole lot about choice. They love choice. They, everybody should have a choice of any insurance program you want. Two and a half million women have chosen Planned Parenthood. They have chosen Planned Parenthood as to where they want to get their quality health care. This legislation would defund Planned Parenthood. It would impact the 12 Planned Parenthood centers here in Iowa and could result in leaving nearly 27,000 patients without the care they want and they need. Now, this ledger, I'll tell you, you can know how bad 
this legislation is by the process that it has gone through. This legislation deals with one-sixth of the American economy, over three trillion dollars. And by definition, it impacts every single person in this country because we all at one time or another need health care. You might think that a, a piece of legislation of such significance would hold, would have numerous hearings and discussions. What do doctors feel as to how this legislation would impact their ability to serve their patients? How do nurses feel about this legislation? How do hospital administrators feel about this, this legislation? How do advocates for senior citizens or people with disabilities feel about this legislation? This legislation is so bad that the Republicans have refused to hold one public hearing and all of their deliberations are behind closed doors. That's how bad this legislation is. And I say to Senators Grassley and Ernst, if you don't believe me, then why don't you listen to virtually every major health care organization in this country, all of whom oppose this legislation. You have the AARP, the largest senior group in America, saying this legislation will be a disaster for seniors and older workers. You have the American Medical Association, the doctors who treat us, they say this legislation is a disaster. You have the American Hospital Association worried to death that if this legislation passes, rural hospitals all over America will shut down. You have the American Cancer Society opposing it, the American Academy of Family Physicians, the American Heart Association, the Catholic Health Association, you have virtually every major health care organization in America saying to the Republicans, do not go forward on that legislation. Now, all of us know, and there is no debate, that the Affordable Care Act, so-called Obamacare, is far from perfect. No one argues that. No one argues that deductibles are too high that co-payments are too high, that premiums are too high, and certainly nobody argues that the prices that we pay for prescription drugs are much, much too high, and that we've got to take on the greed of the pharmaceutical industry. No one is debating that, and what the American people understand is that the sensible way to go forward to say, okay, what are the problems? Put them on the table, let's debate them. Let's see how we can address them. What the American people are saying about the Republican proposal is that they are begging their members of Congress not to go forward. You know what, the last poll was done by USA Today, and you know what percentage of the American people support this Republican plan? 12%. And I suspect it's because those 12% have not examined what's in this bill. This is the most unpopular piece of legislation ever brought forth in the modern history of America. You remember the, remember the bailout of Wall Street? Enormously unpopular. This legislation is even more unpopular than the Wall Street bailout. So how can Republicans go forward with legislation opposed by virtually every major health care organization, overwhelmingly opposed by the people of every state in this country. And the answer comes back to a crisis which is even deeper than the health care crisis. And that is the role that big money plays in American politics today. Brothers and sisters, our job is not only to defeat this disastrous 
proposal. And we've got a lot of work to do in the next few days. But our job is to join the rest of the industrialized world and guarantee health care to all people as a right, not a privilege. Unbelievably, unbelievably, at a time in which we have 28 million Americans today, this is before the Republican legislation, 28 million people with zero health insurance. If the Republican legislation passes, there will be over 50 million people without any health care. And what we have got to ask ourselves and what we have got to demand that Congress address is a very simple fact. How is it that the country I live next to, I live 50 miles away from the Canadian border. How come Canada can provide health care to every man, woman, and child in a much more cost-effective way than our dysfunctional system? How come the United Kingdom and Germany and France and Scandinavia and Ireland and every major country on earth can understand that in the year 2017, health care is a right of all people. Our immediate task with regard to health care is to defeat this horrific legislation. But as soon as we accomplish that, I will be introducing legislation which is gaining more and more support all over this country for a Medicare for all single payer program. We're going to need your help. And we're going to need your help on that. But here's the point. And it is true not only for health care, it is true for so many other issues. You know, the media often states that we are a divided nation. And in some ways we are. There are issues out there, issues of abortion, issue of gay rights, uh, guns. These are issues, in fact, in which Americans are very much divided. But the truth of the matter is that on virtually all of the major economic crises facing this country, guess what? We are not divided, we are united. The Republican leadership, many members of Congress, they say we should cut Social Security. Do you know what the American people say? And I agree, we should expand Social Security. And we should lift the cap on higher income people. And when we lift that cap, we can significantly expand benefits and extend the life of Social Security for another 60 years. I was in Iowa, I think it was in Des Moines, during the campaign, and I was talking about student debt. And I remember like it was yesterday, I was mentioning that in Burlington, Vermont, I had a meeting and a young woman came forward and she said, Bernie, I just graduated medical school and I was $300,000 in debt, which I thought was pretty amazing. And a young woman, I think from Des Moines, came forward and you said, you think that's bad? I just graduated dental school, $400,000 in debt. We live in a competitive global economy. We need the best educated workforce in the world if our economy is going to grow and be prosperous in years to come. Here in Iowa, as you all know, 
This great state was one of the leaders in America in the fight for free public education. That's what Iowa did. But today in 2017, it is time to rethink what we mean about free public education. It's no longer good enough to be free from kindergarten to the 12th grade. We need to make public colleges and universities tuition free. And we need to substantially lower that student debt, which is a nightmare for millions of people in this country. And the point that I want to make here, and it's a point that is very rarely made, you know, my Republican friends tell us, gotta cut this and you gotta cut that, we can't afford it. Total nonsense. This is the wealthiest country in the history of the world. What we cannot afford is that at a time of massive income and wealth inequality, we cannot afford to give huge tax breaks to millionaires and billionaires. But we damn well can afford to make public colleges and universities tuition free by imposing a speculation tax on Wall Street. And by the way, again, we don't hear a whole lot about it on media. We don't hear about it, certainly, from our Republican friends. But what polls tell us is that what at a time when the top one-tenth of one percent now owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent, when many of you are working two or three jobs, but we're seeing 52 percent of all new income going to the top one percent, do you know what? Democrats and independents and Republicans are saying it is time to demand that the wealthiest people in this country start paying their fair share of taxes. Now, after the Republicans are finished with health care, they're going to move to so-called tax reform. Tax reform is just a code word for more tax breaks for the rich and large corporations. And we will not allow that to happen. I was here in Des Moines probably a year ago. And I was talking to somebody, you got a farmer's market here, right, in Des Moines, right? And I went through the farmer's market, was it on a Saturday mornings is when it is? And I went through it and I was talking to some people and I ran into a guy whose job it was, was to collect the, some of the produce that was not sold and take it to an emergency food shelf here in Des Moines. I think he worked for some church. And, and I asked him, I said, I'm kind of curious, what percentage of the people who go to the emergency food shelf are working and what percentage are unemployed. And he said that over 90% of the people who use the emergency food shelf here were working people. And that tells me not only here in Iowa, but in Vermont and all over this country, that if you work 40 or 50 hours a week, you should not be living in poverty. You should not be having to go to an emergency food shelf to feed your family. And that tells me that wages in America are too damn low, and we've got to raise the minimum wage to a living wage, $15 an hour. And here's another area where there is widespread agreement, not disagreement among Republicans, independents, and Democrats. Anybody who gets in their car and drives over roads in this country, anybody who goes over bridges which are in need of repair, anybody who goes to an airport and has to deal with delays every single day, anybody who has a water system that is not producing the quality clean water that we need understands that our infrastructure is collapsing. 
Our job together is to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure. A trillion dollar investment will provide up to 15 million good paying jobs. So my point is that on issue after issue, pay equity for women, widespread agreement. Who in America believes the women should be making 80 cents on the dollar compared to men? In terms of our broken criminal justice system, where we're spending $80 billion a year to lock up more people than any other country on earth, Republicans, independents, Democrats understand that is a broken system. We should be investing in jobs and education, not more jails and more incarceration. <laughs> Immigration reform, majority of the American people understand that we need comprehensive immigration reform and a path towards citizenship. Not Bernie Sanders, the majority of the American people. So that is where we are. We are here in a nation which is facing enormous problems. We are here in a nation in which a lot of our fellow citizens are demoralized and are giving up on the political process. We are living in a nation in which the greed of the billionaire class has no end. They want it all. And what is our job? Our job as people who love this country, and my dad came to this country from Poland without a nickel in his pocket and became the proudest American you ever saw because he saw what this country could do for his family. And that's the story of millions and millions of our people. We are in a momentous moment. There are those in Washington, Mr. Trump and his friends, who want to divide us up based on our religion, who want to divide us up based on the country that we came from, based on the color of our skin, based on our sexual orientation. Because they understand that very few Americans believe in their policies. Very few Americans in Iowa, Vermont, or anywhere in this country think that it makes sense that you give tax breaks to billionaires and throw children off of health insurance, or that you cut Social Security, or that you reject science in thinking that climate change is a hoax. And by the way, I want to congratulate Iowa for helping to lead this country moving toward wind. You've done a great job in that respect. So what a desperate party, a party that has no ideas except serving the interests of corporate America and billionaires, their only play, the only thing they can do is try to divide us up. And our job is not to fall for that bait. Our job is to stand together, black and white and Latino, gay and straight, Asian American, Native Americans, and say that in this country we are going to create a government that works for all of us, not the billionaire class. <laughs> that we are not going to suppress the votes that we're going to revitalize American democracy and create a system which has the highest voter turnout of any country on earth. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, the stakes in this struggle are enormous. They are not just about your lives or my lives. They are about the lives of our children and our grandchildren. They are about whether or not we are going to have a planet that is healthy and habitable. Whether we're going to have a system which is a vibrant democracy. Whether we're going to have an economy that works for all or just a few. That is what is at stake. And I know some of us get tired. And I know that sometimes we turn on the television 
and we become depressed. But all I can tell you is remember American history. Remember the difficult days. Remember 150 years ago, workers in this country were working in factories 70, 80 hours a day and had no power. They stood up and they created the trade union movement. <laughs> Remember that in our lifetimes, our African-American brothers and sisters were denied the right to vote and their kids went to segregated schools. Remember a hundred years ago in this country, women were not running for governor or president. They didn't even have the right to vote, but they stood up and they fought back. Remember that 20 years ago, our gay brothers and sisters did not have basic rights. And today we have gay marriage being legal in every state in this country. The times are difficult, and the people that we are taking on have unbelievable power. They have unlimited amounts of money, and I mean unlimited amounts of money. But I believe today, as I have always believed, it was, is that when working people, ordinary people, stand up and they don't allow ourselves to be divided, when we do that and when we have a vision of an America that works for all of us, nothing will stop us in achieving our goals. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Senator Sanders. So we've got just a little bit time left with Senator Sanders, so I'm going to uh, do a little Q&A with him. And here's, here's what the format's going to look like. So Iowa CCI Action, we sent out an email and asked our followers on Facebook and Twitter what they wanted to ask Bernie. From the submissions, we've selected a few questions from all over the state. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read the selected questions. They'll also be up on these screens. And if it's your question, please wave at us and holler a little bit. Um, and then we'll hear what Senator Sanders has to share with us. Sound all right? All right. So uh, our first question is from Dean Pressman of Ames. Is Dean here? All right. So Dean wants to know, how do we convince your congressional colleagues that a basic health care safety net is a right for all and not a privilege reserved for the rich? We do that when millions of people stand together and we say that if you vote to take away health care, if you do not move us in the direction of every other major country on earth, if you continue to believe that it is okay for millions of Americans not to be able to go to a doctor when they are sick and unnecessarily suffer and sometimes die. If that is what you believe, you're not going to stay in office very much longer. That's a pretty clear message for us CCI Action members, huh? So our next question is from Eric Giddens of Cedar Falls. Eric, are you in the house? All right. So Eric asks, I am running for school board in my community right now. All right. What advice do you have for me and others seeking local nonpartisan elected offices in Iowa in terms of campaigning and then holding these offices? Great. First of all, Eric, congratulations. Good. One of the lovely things, one of the great things that we're seeing all over this country is lots of people getting involved in the political process who a few years ago would not have thought of that. All right? And we're seeing people running for city council, for school board, for state legislature in a way that we have not previously seen and in many cases are doing really, really well. I was in Morgantown, West Virginia, I think last week, 
They ran seven candidates for the city council. Every one of those candidates won. Jackson, Mississippi elected a new, very progressive mayor in Jackson. In California, the grassroots are close to taking over the largest Democratic Party in the St United States of America. So my answer is, what I've always believed, is that the way you win elections and the way you make change is not through 30-second TV ads, but it is by knocking on doors and talking to people. And I'm glad you're running for school board because too often we are not paying the kind of attention that we should to education at the local level. And I think when you knock on doors and you talk about your desire to have high quality education for all kids and the importance of education today and maybe talking about moving toward affordable or free childcare within school systems throughout this state. I think you're gonna find a whole lot of people nodding their heads, whether they're Republicans, independents, or Democrats. So my major suggestion to you is work hard, knock on every door in your district, you'll win the election. Thank you. The next question we have is from Ashley Parker of Des Moines. I know Ashley's here. All right, there, right back there. All right, so Ashley says, scientists report that we will be seeing the devastating effects of global climate change as soon as the next decade. How will we make the bold and absolutely necessary changes to radically reduce our carbon emissions with Republican climate change deniers and big oil cronies in control of most of the branches of our government? Thank you, Ashley, for that question. The debate with regard to climate change is over. The scientific community is virtually unanimous. Climate change is real. The planet is warming. Climate change is caused by human activities. And as the question implies, climate change is already doing devastating harm in our country and around the world. And I have to tell you, frankly, that it really is an embarrassment to all of us that all over the world people are looking at the President and the United States who is saying climate change is a hoax. How can you run a government if you reject basic science? So that's the bad news. The bad news is that we have a President who denies the reality of climate change and has appointed to high positions in the Department of Energy and the EPA some of the most anti-environmental leaders in the modern history of this country. Here is the good news, and it's a lot better than the bad news. And the good news is that all over this country and all over the world, and Trump can't stop it, the movement is toward energy efficiency and sustainable energy. The cost of solar is plummeting. Cost of solar is plummeting. I just met with some of the leaders in the solar and wind industry, and they both say that solar and wind prices will continue to plummet. In Chile, recently, Chile signed a contract which will provide the cheapest electrical electricity production in the history of the world through utility solar resources. Solar costs are going down and down, wind costs are going down and down, energy efficiency is a no-brainer. Making sure that our homes and buildings are energy efficient can save an enormous amount of energy, and by the way, as you know here in Iowa, when we invest in solar, invest in wind, when we invest in energy efficiency, we create millions of jobs. We gotta to move toward transportation, improving our rail system, moving to the electrification of our vehicles, our transportation system. So the momentum is all with us, and it is not with coal, and it is not with oil. Time is on our side.
I think CCI members know something about climate change, don't we? So next we have a question from Karen Finn of Creston. Is Karen in the house? All right. So Karen asks, what can I as an individual citizen do each and every day to have the ideas you express be formed into laws? I think the answer, Karen, uh, in a deep sense, is to use our imagination and rethink our role in society. In other words, we've all, you know, you turn on the television and we watch it, and, and the implication is we're supposed to be good little people and do what we're told to do and not cause trouble and so forth and so on. But if you are a patriot, as everybody is in this room, and you love this country, we've got to think about the roles that we can play at every level of society. It's not just, it's not just writing a letter to the editor. It's maybe asking why more progressive voices are not being heard in the media. It's running for the school board. It's running for the state legislature. It is participating, bringing people together at the local level and say to your state representative, look, we got 100 people who want to hear from you, and if you don't have the guts to confront us, you aren't going to be supported next time around. In other words, raise the stakes. Rethink your role in a democratic society. The truth is that when we stand together, we are very, very powerful. Never forget that. Never forget that. I was just giving an example, if I may, just as an aside. I was in Kentucky last week. Kentucky has benefited more from the Affordable Care Act than any state in the country, more than Iowa, more than Vermont. Their uninsured rate went from 20% down to 7%. Unbelievable success. Their senator is leading the effort to destroy the Affordable Care Act. How does that happen? It happens because people are paralyzed. It happens because people don't think their voices matter. And your job in any and every way you can is to bring people together, raise issues that other people are not talking about, force discussion, and create the kind of vibrant democracy that we need to see. That's it. Okay, we've got two more questions for you. Our next question is from Winifred Standing of Earlham. Are you here, Winifred? Well, let's ask it. So, what is the justification for charging students an unconscionably high interest rate for college loans? There is no rational or moral justification. The reason is that the federal government can make money and then give more tax breaks to people who don't need it. This is a major, by definition, if people are borrowing a whole lot of money, it suggests that they're working class and middle class people. So we're taxing them high in order to give tax breaks to billionaires. So as I've said earlier, what we need to do, and we're going to have legislation that does this, is A, to make public colleges and universities tuition free, and B, to substantially lower student debt. I mean, for a start, and this is a pretty conservative proposal, how many people here have student debt, dealing with student debt? What kind of interest rates are you paying? How much? 8.4%. Yet you go out and you can buy a new car at 2%. You can refinance your home at 3%. That is unconscionable and that is just a, a bad tax on working families. And we're going to lower those student interest rates very substantially. I think you've given us a lot, of, a lot to think about, but just for our final question from Jean Marie Schwendinger of Ankeny, we would like to know, can you please give us three reasons why you are hopeful in this world of chaos? Well, the first reason is we don't have an alternative. I mean, I suppose, you know, that we could turn on the television and hear about another Donald Trump tweet and say, what in God's name is going on? I give up. Can't do anything. But as I mentioned earlier, you don't have the moral right in a sense to do because this is not just about you. I've got seven grandchildren. All right? I've got to fight for those grandchildren. And I've got to fight for your grandchildren. You've got to fight for your kids and your grandchildren. That's number one. Maybe the most important reason from a moral 
perspective. We're fighting for the future of this planet and for our kids and grandchildren. Every one of you who has kids or grandchildren, you love them and you want to do your best. To do your best, you've got to be involved in the political process. All right, that's number one. Number two, I have had the privilege, and it's a, a privilege not bestowed on many people, to not only be a United States Senator from my own state of Vermont, and I hope you all visit us, it's, we are a very beautiful state, but also to have visited 48 states of this country running for president, spending a lot of time in your state. And what I can tell you again from the bottom of my heart, having gone to over 100 meetings in this state, having met with tens of thousands of Iowans, that there is an extraordinary level of beauty and decency, not just here in Iowa, but all over this country, okay? I've gone to your small towns. I've gone to your small towns, a few hundred people, and seen hardworking people, farmers and workers, who are worried about the future for their kids. They don't believe we give tax breaks to billionaires and cut education or health care. I've been to California in their agricultural land and hold rallies at 5 o'clock in the evening, thousands of young people, Latino and black and white kids coming out who understand that we can do much, much more in this country to create the kind of nation we should become. So what I want to tell you, don't believe everything you see on the TV. Yeah, you can get pretty depressed. But having been all over this country, representing my state as well, there is a lot of beauty in this country. There is a lot of decency. Of course there are racists and sexists and homophobes. You're going to see them on TV every night. But they are not the majority of the American people. The majority of the American people they're hardworking, and they're afraid not just for their own lives, they're concerned about what happens to their children. I think people worry more about their kids than they do about themselves. And maybe they disagree with us on this issue or that issue. So what? That's called American democracy. We treasure that. But what I want to tell you, my reason for optimism is having been all over this country, I see the decency in our people. And our job is to bring our people together not allow ourselves to be divided up, to think big, not small, to ask why not, rather than simply listen to billionaires who think we should cut Social Security or health care. That's why I am optimistic, because we are a beautiful country with beautiful people. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you, Senator Sanders, for coming back to Iowa and inspiring so many of us. Thank you.